clock is rolling. I think we are good. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Listening Game Podcast. This is episode number six, I believe. Uh, today, I'm back at my studio, volume 11, and I'm here with Jeff Machado. Am I pronouncing that correctly? You got it. Thank you. One, AKA, of, one, of, one of the few who nailed it right out of the box. I, I do what I can. Well, with a last name as jacked up as mine, I try to <laughs> do what I can to make that work for other people You feel well. the pain, yeah. I very much feel the pain, yeah. I can uh, share at least as many horror stories as you have about... As you have about last name pronunciation issues, I'm sure. Yeah. So I'm here with Jeff Machado, aka Jeff Jensen from Quad 106.5. Jeff was uh, half of the Sean and Jeff Morning Show that I listened to growing up in high school and college back in the 90s and early 2000s, I believe. Somewhere in there is when it uh, stopped. And uh, we've uh, kept in touch off and on over the years. And I started the podcast, called Jeff and said, hey, do you want to come down and talk about your history in radio and what you're up to now and a little bit of everything in between? And he said, sure, come on down. So uh, sure, he'd come on down. And so here we are. And it's a, sh a shameless appeal to my vanity. It works every time. <laughs> it seems to work for a lot of people. <laughs> right. get, uh, I'm having very few bands or other music people say, no, they don't want to do the podcast. Uh -huh. When you get people talking about themselves, uh, people see, tend to like doing that a lot, especially when you're talking about music projects of some sort or another. Sure. Well, plus it's the one subject that I can you know, talk about with a fair degree of confidence that I know what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> exactly. So why don't we start with kind of how you got into doing communication and broadcasting and, and that sort of work. Is that what you went to school for? No, I, in a word, non-traditional. Um, yeah, I, I had no ambitions to be in broadcasting or communications in any way. Um, when I started, <laughs> I'll try and make, it's a weird story, so I'll try and make it as concise as possible. Oh, no, it's, it, I, the, show, the floor is yours, <laughs> my friend. Do whatever, say whatever you want. Um, I, I was in uh, college at UC Davis, and I had a part-time job working at a bakery there. And we used to come in at some god awful, like four o'clock in the morning to pack all the stuff for our route. And we used to listen to Quad, the morning show, when we were packing the stuff for our route. And the guys on the air at the time were Pat Still, who is now over at the country station. I remember that name. Yeah. Yeah. He was there with uh, a guy named Andy Quinn. And the guy who was doing news and weather updates for them was Sean Cash, who eventually wound up being my on-air partner. We were listening to these guys. We used to love listening to them. And we found out that their station was located really close to where our route was. So on a wild hair, the guy I was driving with one morning, it, it's, it's so weird how you look back on certain events in your life and you think, you know, this is one of those key moments where like ever the whole future hinges on this small moment in time and how completely unlikely it was that everything that happened happened the way it did. We get to the building. We decide we're going to stop by the building and give these guys some some of the bread and stuff that we have in the back of the truck. We get to the to the radio station. Parking lot's empty. We go to the front door, completely unmonitored, at seven o'clock in the morning with a station with people actually working up there on the air. There's nobody guarding the front door. We just walk right in. It has a keypad, but for some reason it wasn't working. We get to the elevator. We get to the floor where the radio station is. Front door is open. Again, supposed to be completely locked, front door's wide open. So we go in, the radio station's completely dark. There's nobody there except the guys who are doing the morning show. And they're like way down the hall. You can see this little light burning down the hall where the studio is. Me being the typical wimp that I am, I'm thinking we got to bail out. I mean, we're going to be, we're like 30 seconds from seeing the blue and red lights. My partner says, my driving partner, he said, no, let's just go back and, you know, talk to the guys on the air. I said, we're, we're breaking and entering, man. This is like trespassing, right? Ah, don't worry about it. Come on back. <laughs> So he leads a very reluctant me down the hall back to the studios and they, the, guy, the guys who are on the air, uh, they're in the middle of their show and they look over and they see two strangers standing in the hallway, obviously a little shocked. But when they realized we weren't there to kill them, I, you know, they relaxed and how are you doing? Come on in. They sat us down, started having a nice conversation with them. And then once they found out that we had food for them, that was sort of like the golden ticket right now. All of a sudden the red carpet is open whenever we want to come by. So we made it a habit of stopping by on our little bread delivery route and we just if we had day old bread or something we had they had a, a balcony up on their story we just take the bread and we throw it up on the balcony like, <laughs> so, so this uh, black market delivery system or whatever it is you want to call it but it 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 did what it what it needed to do it sort of got us into the building and my friend he wasn't so much into it he kind of faded away but i was kind of hooked you know i saw what was going on with the with the radio station and, and what they were doing and i was like man this is really cool so I tried to make it a point to be around as much as I could just to be around it and soak it in. And it was 
not, certainly not a unique time in radio, but it was a, a it was sort of the trail end of that era in radio where everything was small owners and operators right. owning all these small independent stations. And it was before the big fish came in and swallowed everybody. And there was a very tight feeling of camaraderie amongst the, the on-air staff at the station that I, I have never seen at any radio station since. And I can only assume that that was very common back in the 70s and, you know, sort of the heyday of radio. But it was starting to die out by the time I got in. It, it, it was still there, though, and very tight. These guys would go and they'd play softball games together and they'd go shoot basketball together. They'd have parties at all. It was the only radio station I've ever been to where you could walk in any time of the day or night and there was always somebody in the on-air studio with the person who was on the air. And it was a buddy or a friend or a friend of a friend. And it would, they were just hanging out. It was like a big lounge atmosphere. It was just very fun to be around and very addicting for someone who that's so far outside of my comfort zone. I, I had no aspirations to do it. And given my natural personality, would have never been in a situation like that. All of a sudden to be accepted by this group was just like, wow, you know, I can't get enough of this. So after hanging around for a little while and making myself useful wherever I could, um, I think the first official gig I had at the station was updating their snow phone. Like they had a, an automated number you would call in and there was just an answering machine giving snow conditions for the, the resorts around the, around the area. And the guy who, norm I think it was Sean who was supposed to update it. And he got, see, he had like an attack of kidney stones or something and he got sick. He couldn't update the snow phone. So I said, I'll, I'll update the snow phone for you. Oh my God, thank you so much. You know, it's this huge appreciation because I left a message on their answering machine, but whatever. So I did that. That sort of got me on the radar, like, hey, look at this guy. He's willing to do, you know, these crappy little utility jobs for us. So I started doing these crappy little utility jobs around the station. And that sort of led to me filling in on weekends. And um, that got me into like overnight shifts. At the time, they were actually live jocks on the air. 24 hours a day, again, unheard of now, but fairly commonplace at the time. And um, I was doing, I would come out when Sean was doing his 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. And we just shoot the breeze, hang out, talk, whatever. And that's sort of where we started to form the little nugget of an idea that we could do our own show together because we were hitting it off pretty well. So we, like between five and six o'clock, again, one of those weird situations that should not happen under any circumstances that did. The station was completely unmonitored by anybody who was in charge at the time. The guy who was running the station, Ed Stoltz, who was the owner operator, was very much a night owl. So he would be in there from like 10 o'clock at night to like four in the morning, tinkering, engineering, doing his stuff. And then he'd just take off. And the kids were running at the candy store until, you know, somebody from the sales department rolled in around 10 o'clock or maybe somebody from programming showed up around nine. In between, it was just do whatever you, you want to do with this 50,000 watt radio station that... <laughs> the kids were in, in, in complete control of. So from five to six in the morning before the morning show showed up, Sean and I would get on the air and we would do these little bits and stuff together for just that one hour. Unbeknownst to anybody. And this went on for weeks, if not months with nobody catching on. Um, the guy who was doing mornings then at the time, um, his name was Axel Marley. He had to go back. He lives, he has family back East. He had to go back home for a week and we volunteered to fill in for him for a week. We said, hey, we've been doing this stuff. We've been working out some little bits and whatever. They said, eh, whatever. They just wanted somebody sitting behind the microphone so that it wasn't dead air. Well, we fit the bill. So they said, okay, go ahead and fill in for a week. So they had us fill in for a week and we never left. They kept us on. They just sort of liked the sound of it or the back and forth or the energy or whatever. And um, yeah, one week turned into seven and a half years. Wow. So yeah, that's like I say, very unconventional. And just weird when you look back on it, like it seems so preordained, but I'm sure it was just freak luck. And that was all happening at what? At quad. At quad. Yeah. Yeah. The old 106.5. Nice. Okay. What, what year was that that you started? Doing uh, the, geez, I started, um, I probably started hanging out about like late 91, early 92. Okay. And we got our first shot at doing mornings together in May of 93. So that, Okay. So I started listening somewhere around... I guess it would have been around 92 or so, I think, is okay. I remember. I can vividly remember uh, laying in bed with my alarm clock go off in the morning to get ready for school or whatever. Uh -huh. High school, I'm not that, you know, the, right. not to make me sound like I was you <laughs> no, know, 12 fine. listening to your show or anything. Uh -huh. But I can remember being probably a senior in high school or so. Okay, that's fine, because that makes me feel younger, so that's oh, yeah, fine. Yeah, so, no, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> and um, hearing, like, the dial-a-date uh, show kind of kick off and hearing you guys, when people would call in and 
pair them up and whatever. And uh, um, I think that's kind of my first memories of like, oh yeah, that's a pretty funny show and hearing the different uh, bits that would go on then. And, yeah. Um, and you probably remember them better than I do because it, so much of that time is just a blur to me. I, thinking back, I always tell myself I should have, you know, kept a journal or whatever, but it's, it was, it's, <laughs> it's just fuzzy to me now. So much stuff happened in such a short period of time, you know? So you were at quad for seven and a half years, seven and a half. We were there from 93 through the end of 2000. Okay. And that's when we jumped ship and went over to the zone. And both of you guys went, was that because mm -hmm. quad changed formats and just didn't want to do a morning show thing anymore? Or? No, actually it was because they offered us more money. Oh, um, fair they, enough. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, I wish I could give you some sort of political intrigue type answer, but it was pretty cut and dried. I mean, that things at quad were, I mean, they were always sort of iffy and sketchy and you never really knew what was going to happen from one day to the next. And the format was sort of undergoing a lot of changes. Our, our, prog our longtime program director, Alex Cosper, had left. I know Alex um, a little bit. Yeah. 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 It, it's sort of like the mid to, to late 90s. He left and we had a new guy come in and it was alternative was sort of taking a, a, a different turn away from the more eclectic stuff and into the more mainstream rock stuff. And you know, it was sort of attracting a new, a new crowd, a new vibe. And we realized that we were getting older too. And we were sort of aging our way out of what our target audience was. So things were kind of sketchy and wonky there just from the terms of us fitting what the station was trying to do. And, um, we always had our eye on the zone ever since they, they changed from what was, uh, I forget what, what they were called before, um, before they were the zone, but when they made their transition about 95, 96, yeah. And they went to the more soft alternative stuff. And we always had an ear open for that and thought, you know, for the age we are and for the demographic that we attract, which was always predominantly female, that's probably a better fit for us. So when we found out that they had an opening in mornings, we just kind of threw a line out there and said, hey, what do you think? And they said, hey, come on over and give it a try. So, yeah, that's all there was to it. It was just I think it was a better fit for us, but they were also doubling our pay so that, that didn't suck yeah. that's pretty easy math to do <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah okay i didn't know that you guys had a predominantly female following yeah, it, um, it wasn't ridiculously so but it was significant and that was unusual at quad for sure considering the type of music we were playing i mean it's sort of eclectic and harder edged alternative that you would think would appeal more to a younger male audience and yet we were attracting these older female listeners interesting yeah one of them was my wife. Oh, is that how <laughs> you met her? As it turned out, yeah, that's how she, she was a listener. Really? She was a groupie. I married a groupie. How did, so how did that come about? <laughs> Technically, you, I guess. If you don't mind sharing that story. No, not at all. Um, she was new in town. She had just um, come in from uh, New Mexico and she was um, uh, teaching. She was uh, part-time teaching, a substitute teacher at the time and working part-time as a waitress at, um, <laughs> at, uh, Chili's on Sunrise and just down the street from there where the Elephant Bar is now, right by the Sunrise Mall. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Right. Was a club that used to be called the Shark Club. It was a, a nightclub. And uh, we were doing like Wednesday nights out there as part of a promotion for the radio station. And she heard us on the air and thought, oh, those guys sound fun. And I kind of like the music. And um, so she came down one night and uh, just hung out at our table and just, oh, hi, I just wanted to meet you. I wanted to come say hi. I like the show, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, we hit it off. Um, <laughs> it's funny because Sean and I are sitting at the table and she comes over and she starts talking amongst us. And you, you can sort of tell that pivot in the conversation where she starts paying less attention to Sean and more attention to me. Like there's a spark here. So Sean picks up on this and good wingman that he is, excused himself from the table and went over to the bank of video games and just played video games for like two hours while I was hitting on this woman who would become my wife. And, um, he was, it was a centipede. It was a stand up centipede game. And a couple of years later, when they closed down the club, when they were converting it over to a restaurant, um, we went in there and bought the centipede game out of the club. And Sean still has the thing. He's it's still nice. in the, in the business where he is, the, the game is still there. So that's our, our little piece of history. But, um, yeah, we, we had a great conversation. We hit it off and she, she invited me to, well, <clears throat> I was, I told her that we were going to go to the NXS concert, which was that Saturday. NXS was playing at Arco Arena and I'm the biggest clueless idiot in the world because she kept dropping these very subtle hints like, oh, gee, I've always wanted to go see NXS. Oh, it'd be fun to go see them. Gee, I was going to be doing something on Saturday, but I don't really have any plans. And all this is going straight over my head. Right. And finally, like the light bulb comes on. I'm like, oh, 
<laughs> I'm putting two and two together here, right? So I, would you like to go to the concert? Yes, I would love to go to the concert. Thank you, idiot, for finally asking me. So we decided we were going to go to this concert. I don't mean to take this story too far, but it's a funny no, no, aside. No, by all means. It was not in, in the afterglow of making this connection with this person that I was really uh, attracted to and just had a really good connection with. Uh, it took me like two hours before I realized that I had already committed to taking another girl to the concert that night. Oh, really? um, so, and it, was, it wasn't really, from my perspective, it wasn't really a date kind of a thing. She was a local photographer who sort of wanted to get access to the band. And I said, well, I'd be happy to bring you along. And, you know, because I, I knew we were going to get backstage and there were probably going to be a lot of good opportunities for her. Um, but I, it completely slipped my mind in the, in the fuzzy haze of pre-love. Uh, so uh, anyone with any degree of maturity or balls at that, at that point would have, you know, made their decision and said to the other person, gee, I'm sorry, but I have somebody else that I'm going to take and I'm, I'm very sorry, but can we do something some other time or whatever? But I had neither, <laughs> I had neither the balls nor the maturity. So I turned it into some stupid sitcom premise and i tried to take both of them to the show at the same time and i i sort of explained to the 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 photographer that i was going to be back and forth with somebody else that i that i was going to take so it wasn't complete it wasn't like sitting each other across from the stadium and me just running back and forth the whole time pretending i'm with both of them they both knew that both of them were going to be there but the photographer didn't realize how much time i was going to be spending with my future wife and she had sort of a different spin on the way things were going to go that night than I had in my naivete. I thought it was just going to be two friends hanging out. And I think she thought it was like more a date date kind of a thing. And she was just pissed. I mean, <laughs> I did everything I could. I'm picking up on the vibe. Of course, I'm doing everything I can to make it up for. And I got her backstage and I got her good access with the bands and blah, blah, blah. But she was just teeth grinding, seething, enraged. And not that I blame her, but <laughs> I had a great time with Lisa, my future wife, and we spent like two hours after the show talking. And I escort her to the front door with no kiss because I was a gentleman. And I get back home and it's like, I don't know, like two o'clock in the morning. And my telephone rings and it's, it's the photographer woman who I essentially stood up to go on a right. date with my wife. <laughs> I'm like, who in the hell could be calling at two in the morning? I pick it up, hello? And this is the voice on the other end just says, I hope you got laid tonight because you just lost a friend. Bang, Bang. <laughs> down goes the phone. <laughs> huh. So yeah, I didn't talk to her a whole lot after that, but the payoff was obviously worth right, it. Right, yeah. <laughs> Thinking long game. <laughs> yes, exactly. that okay. Did you ever actually have to deal with that photographer again for other yes, work yes. events? Yes, yes. No, we, we made up. She understood eventually. Okay. And I, 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 after several mea culpas and peace offerings on my part, you know, we kind of ironed things out. So everything was cool. Okay. Yeah. So. Was that the, uh, this, you may not even remember this, um, was that the Arco Arena in excess show that Material Issue opened? I believe it, it was. was. Like, for, like a super cheap show, like nine or 10 bucks or something. Yeah, and, yeah. It was like that. And it, it, this would have been 94. Four. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah. So, uh, random sidebar, real quick. So, I uh, I was a huge Material Issue fan growing up. Still am. I uh, love all their records. They would come through town a lot, and they'd interview with you guys. And there were always shows in Sacramento, but they were notorious for playing twenty one plus venues only. And we were still nineteen, twenty or so. Got it. Whenever they'd come through promoting their new record. Mm -hmm. So the show right before that one, they came through town, and Material Issue was going to play one of the clubs around town, the Cattle Club, maybe or something to that effect. Okay. We all found out about it and went, we're, we're going, we're so excited. We finally get to see Material Issue. Uh, uh, found out about a month before the show, they've changed venues. It's now at Malarkey's. We were, were living in Vacaville and Fairfield at the time. Oh, wow. Okay. Had no idea where Malarkey's was. So we made right. a special trip up here in advance to find the club and make sure we knew where it was. Mm -hmm. We were not going to miss this. Then it dawned on us, the show is on the same night that was the first night of the English class we'd signed up for at college. And if you miss night one, they drop you and it screws up your whole semester. Ah. So we faked a death. Okay. And several of us walked into the class that night wearing shirts and ties and dark sunglasses and the whole bit. No Professor, way. we're very sorry. There's been a death. We have to go to Sacramento to go to Memorial. Can you please excuse us for this class? We'll be here next week. He bought it hook, line, and sinker. Wow. Very sorry for your loss. Sir. Here's your syllabus. See you next week. No huh. problem. So we're in the car, like changing out of shirts and ties, <laughs> driving from Fairfield to Sacramento to get to that show. Mm. Walk up to Malarkey's and there's a big A-frame sign out front that says material issue tonight has been canceled. Oh. So we drive home, get our refunds, and we were pissed at the band. No idea why they canceled. No idea what happened or anything. Just... 
Oh, I cannot believe we faked the death. We drove all this way <laughs> twice what? to see this band. Best Not going to see it. Yeah. So whenever they'd come on the radio after that, I, t- I couldn't listen for months. Like, screw this. I turned it off. Like, you ah. broke my heart. I, I did. Yeah, basically. It's like, I want to see Material Issue. We've tried like five times. They're finally playing a show in town and they cancel it. What the hell? And we turned uh-huh. it off and like couldn't listen. So when they came back through at that NXS show, uh-huh. I was still mad. I'm like, no, I don't care if it's in excess for $10 and material issues opening. I'm not going on. Uh. We wouldn't go out of just spite of all this effort we put into seeing them a few months earlier, only to have it, you know, fall at our feet at the last minute like that. Uh. And then when material issue got home from that tour, uh, apparently something on that tour didn't go well. And the singer actually killed himself like a month later. Right, we never got right. to see material issue live. Uh. Um, but that's those are the only two shows I ever hear of people mentioning are the the Malarkey's one, the Malarkey's one, uh-huh. and the NXS show. And I've apparently I known lots of people that were at that NXS show that said they had a good time. And yeah, as I remembered, of. it was fantastic. So you had an amazing night that night and met your future wife. And I think yes. that show was the final straw in the material issue, you know, pile of, of things that just like no, oh, I can't do that anymore. And yeah. So the 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 takeaway lesson is grab the opportunities when you can. Very much right? so. Yeah, yeah. That and. Um, that and when and fake a death that's great i gotta put that one in the playbook we totally (laughs) faked a death about three or four of us went in and uh i think two of us were actually signed up for the class maybe three of us were signed up and had to go in everyone else kind of waited in the car but had to wear the attire to make it you know believable and all that and so um we all had to go in together or something it was a long time ago (laughs) but yeah there was we actually faked the death to a college professor to try to attend the show and impressive fall at our feet like that and but yeah i've met several people over the years that were at that uh that NXS show. And yeah, great, show. great stories about it. And Fantastic. no idea that's how you met your wife and was the, the first date for. Yeah. That was it. Guys. Yeah. Pretty impressive. Yeah. I guess as first dates go, it left a pretty, pretty good first impression. Yeah. It sounds like it. I, um, I knew you would, I, I remember you talking about your wife on, on the air when you guys mm-hmm. would do the, the program. I'd had no idea that that's how you met her. That was through a quad promotion. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I always so, had it in my head somehow that, you guys knew each other before that through maybe college or, or something nope. else. And nope, not a bit. Nice. Not a bit. She, she was a fan. <laughs> it's as awkward as that is to say. That it's happens true. every once in a while, though, that some, somebody in, in a public light meets a, a fan and they become their wife or husband or whatever the, yeah. the case is. And, yeah, and it's just and awkward to think about having a fan. I, I'm even uncomfortable saying that word. You know? it, and it's because you know, when you're on that side of the microphone when you're doing the show you know you know how the sausage gets made so it's not that big of a deal to you it's just like going to work you know i mean it's it's fun work don't get me wrong it was outra- and i i told myself when i first started doing it that i was going to do it until somebody told me i couldn't because it was such a unique opportunity for i mean sure who, whoever gets a chance to host their own morning radio show for god's sake i'm not going to pass that up and it was a blast but i i don't think it was anything that necessarily would attract fans. I, I don't know if that's just a naive perspective on my part or what, but it, it, it didn't have that aura of, Oh, we're so cool. It was just a couple of guys having a conversation. You know, it's like we're doing right now, but with people listening, you know, like thousands and thousands of people. And so it never really occurred to me that people would be that into it, but it, it was just strange. Every once in a while, you'd meet somebody who was a longtime listener to the show. And I've seen people who are so excited to meet us that literally their hands were shaking. And I'm like, dude, you, you know what I do, right? I mean, you, there's no mystery to this. It's not, you know, if you peel away those layers of mystique, it's just a couple of guys having a BS conversation, really. But there's, I don't know, there's something about radio that it still has that magic, even after all these years. It still uh, still fires the imagination, I guess. Yeah. Are you still as big of a fan of radio now as when you were working in the industry, or does it does it change your your skew on things? Um, um, after doing it for so long, I'm, I'm very much a fan of the medium, not so much a fan of the industry, I guess is how I would put that. Understandable. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's amazing to me seeing how entertainment has progressed from, you know, the early 20th century and how it goes from radio to television to, you know, black and white movies, to color movies, to 3d movies, to the internet, to, you know, you have all these things that are snowballing on top of each other and, and entertainment is getting progressively more and more sophisticated and more and more people are getting you would think desensitized to it because it's you know we're so saturated with it now even amidst all that there's still something about listening to the radio that really captures people's attention and i don't know if it's the theater of the mind thing or that you have to use your imagination so much that it engages that sense that otherwise tv would be filling in the blanks for you you kind of have to do it yourself with your brain but it, it amazes me that it has never lost its mystique and so uh, that uh, radio is very attractive for me in that sense and you know like listening to podcasts and things like that and you know just just being able to 
engage your imagination like that. Um, you know, good storytelling, you know, it, it all comes back to that. When, it, when somebody's telling a story on the radio and I'm, my brain is filling in the other pieces, there's just a magic to that that I find really appealing. But in terms of the industry, it's not, not to get too far up on my soapbox, but it was very different when I started. Like I said, it was all small owner operator stations and there weren't the big um, media conglomerates hadn't got their sticky fingers into everything yet. And people had a real passion for it. Um, the guy who was running quad at the time had a reputation for just being a maniac around town. And he, I mean, he, he had a very unique personality. Let's just put it that way. And he had his detractors in the industry and was constantly being sued by people left, right, and center. And was definitely an odd duck, but cared about the station. I mean, he had a genuine passion for what he was doing and everybody who was there had a genuine passion for what they were doing. And people who were on the air were mentored. You know, they had people who had come before who really knew what they were doing that sort of showed them the ropes and you, you sort of worked your way up through the ranks and everybody who, who came before you, that, that passion was sort of infectious and you picked up on it. And the, the, the programming departments were, um, very they appreciated the on-air talent they knew that that was sort of you know you can get music on any radio station but that talent was just that station right so that was like one of your main assets and and people sort of realized that at the time and i maybe i'm biased because i was in that position so i sort of think of it's close to my heart you know i, I i'm sort of very protective of people who are on the air but now it's it's been commoditized i think to the point so much where it's just a paycheck to to programming departments now um people who are on the air are are just a bottom line you know they're a number it, it's somebody to you know talk up liner notes and talk about what the station's going to be promoting in between songs and commercials and nobody really cares about mentoring young talent and you know that's that was one of the real benefits of having 24-hour jocks you know if you had a live shift from 10 to 2 in the morning or from 2 to 6 in the morning that's where you that was your farm team right that's where you put the up-and-comers who are learning the craft and they don't they don't have that anymore they don't have that opportunity and they don't have a lot of people on the air to teach them now who are really focused on the entertainment aspect of radio it, it's they're just liner note readers a lot of them for the most part now and they're they're not respected by management they're the the expensive talent, the ones that really do their job and do it well and know the craft of entertaining, got cut left and right because they were too expensive. And the people who came in to replace them are there because they would work cheap and they would, you know, they would be on the air because it's cool to be on the air and they would do do it for much less money. So it kind of stepped down the quality level of the industry a lot when we sort of made that transition from small stations to, you know, one giant media conglomeration owning all the stations. And, you know, you'd have people who are, you have people on the air now who are being voice tracked in five other stations around the country and, but being paid for being on the air on one station, you know, it's this, this whole, yeah, I, I could go on for a while about it, but it, it kind of soured me on the industry. Do you listen to any particular radio programs? Actually, still, yeah, or? I do. I do. Uh, I listen to, um, uh, the morning show on 107.9, the end, Okay, because that's the station my kid likes to listen to. And we sort of got hooked listening while I drive him to school. And they're really, they're really good. They, um, they, they, I don't want this to sound egotistical in any way, but they remind me of Sean and I in that they, you can tell that a lot of what they say is very genuine. You know, they don't, they pre-plan a lot of what they're going to say, but a lot of it's off the cuff and a lot of it comes from the heart and you can tell they're given the latitude to run a segment a little bit longer, you know, and, you know, and, it doesn't have to be under 45 seconds. They can stretch things out to two minutes or three minutes or five minutes if it's working for crying out loud, which is again, something you don't get to see a lot of today. And they have a really good rapport between them and they're just very down to earth. And um, yeah, so I like when I hear things like that, I'm like, ah, somebody's still, somebody's still doing it the same way we did. That's how it's it was, working. That's how it was for you guys. You got to have kind of your own latitude to do whatever you wanted with most of the show. And to excess sometimes, yes. I mean, we... If anything, we had the opposite problem and that somebody should have come in and told us to shut up after, <laughs> you know, these long 10, 15 minute harangues. Well, we didn't have the, um, the, the methods to, to monitor and measure the audience weren't nearly as sophisticated when we started. And plus we were at, remember quad, the radio station where nobody pays any attention to what you're right. doing. So you could talk for 15 minutes and nobody's going to come and tell you to stop. 
Um, that was probably a bad thing for us because it got us into that habit. And there are definitely times when we should have just shut up and played another song. But um, is there a particular story you you can think of that you think, oh, this bit we milked this a little bit too far? And, uh, and I'm sure the there are, I'm or? sure there are a lot of them. There's one that comes to mind is we had a comedian on the air that um, his name was Doctor Gonzo, and he was a big friend of the show. Anytime he would come through and do the punchline, he would come and be on the show. And his thing was, he, it was like musical comedy. He, he um, would bring his guitar and he would do like little bits, you know, like little, uh, like little weird Al type parody. Okay. Like he'd do a measure or two from a couple of songs, but throw in some funny lyrics or whatever, or he'd make up his own songs. And the lyrics were always sort of, you know, based around what was happening in pop culture events at the time. And we just let him go. And this guy like ran through his whole repertoire. And I mean, we like, we were scraping the bottom of the barrel and you know, anybody <laughs> with any sense of, you know, uh, of showmanship where you're always supposed to leave them wanting a little bit more yeah. would say, okay, after this has run on for maybe three or four or five minutes, you might want to say, okay, we'll be back after this with more or take a little break. Nah, we just let the guy go. And yeah, it's embarrassing to look back on it and realize what poor showman we were. Like we never had anybody to show us how to structure a show like entertainment, the, the bare bones of entertainment that have worked since vaudeville that a lot of people know, but we obviously didn't. Um, so yeah, it's kind of embarrassing to look back on and think, Ooh, yeah, you could have benefited from a producer or an editor or just somebody with a big off switch, <laughs> but eh, whatever it, uh, you know, lesson learned. Maybe that's part of why you guys had such a unique fan base for the, this kind of station you were on though, was because you didn't follow the same pattern that everyone, everyone else did. And something about that maybe appealed to, I would hope the so female crowd that listened to alternative <laughs> music more than other demographics i and- certainly hope so but you know back to my point about not being able to monitor the the listeners as accurately then as we do now sure. they know a lot more now about how how short people's attention spans really are when they're listening to radio and how you know it's on in the car for a couple of minutes if you're lucky and that's all the time you have with them so for us to ramble on for 15 minutes was essentially pointless nobody could sit around and listen for us the whole time with very few exceptions you know you could punch in for a couple minutes and then punch out but our theory always was if we can hook them, we can get them to listen longer. And I, that was probably naive slash egotistical on our part, because I'm sure the reality is that people listen as long as they can, but they're at work. They got to go. They, they have no choice. So I know it, it personally, I know it worked at least in some respects. Cause like I was like most people, we would listen in the car on the way to college or on the way to wherever we were going at the time. Huh. But I can vividly remember, um, a time when you guys were doing the Wiener Wednesday show for mm-hmm. the people on the podcast that don't know what that is. That was a show. If I remember the tagline correctly, it was <laughs> if you have wronged someone or been wronged by someone or something to that effect. Exactly. You write right. down yes. the story. Uh, it was basically, if you've been a big wiener to someone or had someone be a big wiener to you, you send in the Wiener Wednesday story and then you guys would read it on the air and you'd read right. a handful of them. And the most hilarious one would win concert tickets or whatever the, the prize was that week. And Exactly. Um, and those were genius. I mean, there were some <laughs> stories that we would talk about for weeks afterwards. Of like, remember the one about the girl that did this to her boyfriend or the guy that sent this postcard or that thing or whatever? And there were some like, for quite a while later, we'd be at a party, you know, not related to radio, not related to music. I'd just be with my friends that I was with at that point in time. And it'd be six, eight, 12 months later. And one of those stories would come up in conversation. God, remember that Sean and Jeff's or the Wiener Wednesday story when so and so sent a postcard in of her making out with their ex boyfriend, and the dad got a hold of it or whatever the the story was, and um, they were hilarious to the point where, yeah, we had to list only listen in the car on the way to work or whatever. But I can vividly remember around that time dragging portable radios into where I worked, like at the nice. pizza joint or at the real estate <laughs> office. And setting it up, telling them like, I've got to listen to the rest of the show today, you guys. Just like, you got to humor me and put up with the radio for half an hour because I need to hear who wins this Wiener Wednesday story. It was, oh, it was so good. I'm glad it worked. It, oh, it completely worked. We had, yeah, I wish we had better demographics or better ways to tell you guys, you know, what kind of impact it was having on, on different people around. It was, it was a great radio station. I don't, I don't mean to sound like a, I was ever stalking the band, the, no, no, the DJs not. or anything, but. um it, yeah, it was, it was a, there were some great stories and, and there were some fun moments bits in yeah, there over the years. It, that it's really funny you bring up, up the, the Wiener Wednesday segment because it's, we knew that we were onto something when we, we used to solicit the stories by fax and this will sort of date us. This is um, the, when they, the, the fax machines would have that giant roll of paper that all the faxes would spit out on the big, like, uh, like uh, what is it? The paper towel roll yeah, of, yeah. Of, of paper, right? This nonstop. And, uh, 
so we, we set out the call one Wednesday. Okay, get your stories in here. And like 45 minutes later, one of our interns goes back to check. And the, the fax machine had emptied itself. It was this huge nonstop roll, this giant like yards and yards and yards of this uncut fax paper with all these stories printed on it. We thought, ooh, good crop today. <laughs> so yeah, that's when we kind of knew that something was working with that, with that segment. I was always curious about that. How many, uh, like rough guess, how many stories would you guys get on any given winter Wednesday? Wow. Um, on, especially in the earlier days yeah. when it first started, Wow, like 50, 60 oh, wow. on nice. a really good day. And then um, as, as we kind of ran it into the ground, uh, the stories sort of tapered off, but they, they, would, they, incre- they decreased in quantity, but increased in quality because people kind of got hip to what we were looking for. So yeah, a good day, we'd have like 10, 15, maybe 20 of them. Okay. But they were all, it was tough to pick a good one. They were all really good. My friends and I sent in, I think two over the years, huh. um, one of us, and we, I had a collective of me and three or four other guys, and we all listened pretty regularly and- somebody would inevitably have just gotten dumped or, you know, had something go awry at work or some combination of the two or whatever was happening. And we sit around and mock the other person for a while and go, you know what? That would make a good Wiener Wednesday story. Let's write it in and let's fax that in. Yeah. Good buddies do. Right. Pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Like like good buddies do. And it was always a, um, it was always a nice feeling when I think we sent in the two stories and we thought, Hey, they both got read on the air. I don't think we won either one of with either one of them, but, um, I remember both of you know, I was feeling good, like, oh, our, it was good enough to be read on the air. They didn't right. read our story and go, oh, that's terrible, and just chuck it. Like, we got through at least that first barrier, and like, okay, that's, you know. We're in the game. Yeah, yeah. Good, good enough, you know, uh, fodder there for another couple stories out of, you know, out of this crowd or whatever. And, right. right, yeah, it's uh-huh. amazing what's happened to people. And honestly, I don't care if 90% of them were fake. They were funny. <laughs> they were entertaining. Were, were a lot of them fake? I'm sure a lot of them were. I'm sure a lot of them were. And I, to give away an industry secret, um, it, Later on, when we shifted radio stations and we went over to the zone, um, we'd had segments where we would a, a lot of the stuff that we did was was set up. It was pre staged. Really, it was faked. Yeah, but um, not all of it. But that was sort of the magic, is you never knew when we were pulling the wool and when we weren't. Okay, now I've I've got to ask because I'm curious about one of them. If, if you don't want to say, you don't want to. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, Sean and Jeff make the call. That was a segment where a lot of the ones we, we wound up with like a repertory of players. Like we'd have a Rolodex of like six to a dozen people that we knew were always reliable and very quick on their feet yeah. in terms of being able to ad lib. And we'd call them up the night before and we'd say, okay, here's the scenario. You're Bob. Bob just uh, decided he's going to come out to his dad. Uh, you call us and ask us what you think we should do. And okay, run with it. And then we'd tape the thing and just edit it up and really it on the air like it was really happening. Were yeah. those all and fake? The Sean no, no, they weren't all fake, but if there was... um. If we had a, a week where we didn't have a good one yeah. or, you know, we were sort of in a pinch and we needed something to fill in, then we'd, we, we'd go to our Rolodex of actors and say, okay, guys. I had no idea. Here, here's the setup. <laughs> but I, that one I completely bought hook, line, and sinker. I figured oh, it was fantastic. Good. I'm glad. That. The, there was the, the, My favorite one of all that we, we faked was um, a guy who called in and he, he, would, he had, the scenario was he had had a first date with this, um, this girl and they had gone to a he had taken her to some burger joint, right? Like he thought this was like the big deal and he took her to McDonald's or something <laughs> like that. And he, the guy we got to do this was the best ad libber in the world and just came out with this stuff about why, you know, why, why don't you think, you know, going out for hamburgers is, oh, I, I'm a classy guy, whatever. And he just, he, he just, he laid it on so thick and he played that sort of clueless redneck part so well. And he just went on and on and on with it. And it was hilarious. I mean, we couldn't stop laughing and we knew the thing was fake. It's like, yeah, I, there's a part of you that feels guilty for setting the whole thing up and, and, and faking people out. But we, we sort of had a long history of doing that anyway, going all the way back to our um, daytime fireworks um, bit, which I don't I remember don't if you I know that one. That one, we did this every 4th of July. We would claim that the, um, because the, the radio station at the time, when Quad moved uh, downtown, they were at the top of the Renaissance yeah. Tower. And it was the, the highest point in the city at that point it was just a spectacular panoramic view so we claimed that we had gotten fireworks that we were going to shoot off the top of the building and they were special daytime fireworks that were supposed to be fully visible in broad daylight so we were going to actually do it for the last hour of our show we were going to sneak up onto the heliport there was actually a helipad up on top of the building and we were going to shoot off these fireworks and you could see them if you wanted to come downtown you could 
you know, if you were driving around right. or if you wanted to go to um, Cesar Chavez Park, which was just kitty corner from the building, you could just hang out in the park and watch the fireworks. And we'd have people show up every year. They'd spread out blankets. They'd go sit out in the park waiting for these daytime fireworks. <laughs> we're like, guys, hello, daytime fireworks, really? And of course, we had no access to the building nor things to shoot off of them, which was, you know, a good thing <laughs> in hindsight. But we'd have people calling in all the time. What's I, I'm driving around. I can't see the fireworks. Oh, they're up there. Just keep looking for them. They're up there. And <laughs> We would pull the wool over people's eyes every year. And half the fun of it was the people who we faked out last year would call in the next year and pretend like it was the coolest thing they'd ever seen. Like, oh my God, how do you guys get it to be so phosphorescent? You know, the colors, I mean, it's almost like neon. It's so brilliant and blazing. And then you get a call five <laughs> seconds later. I can, what the hell is that guy talking about? I can't see what's happening. So that was, yeah, we had a long history of, of faking people out. But that's part of the fun and the magic of radio is, you know, you can, you can do it. It works. Nice. You may, you may not remember this, but now that you've mentioned the, the make the call, Sean and Duff make the calls were faked. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, really curious about one. There was yes. one you guys had where, uh, let me see if I can remember the story correctly. Woman called in and said she thought her, I think husband was having an affair or something because she kept seeing his truck down at her girlfriend's house. And... That's ringing a vague bell. And, uh, so they called the, the husband up and said, hey, your, your wife called and said, she wants to know why you're always over at you know, Stephanie's house or whatever. And he said, actually, I'm over there because Stephanie has informed me that my wife keeps hanging out with this guy, Mike. And she's seen Mike's truck over at the house a whole bunch of times. And so I'm over there asking about her. And so you guys, I think, initially called the woman. And, and then she had said, call my husband and say this. And he got that info. And he called back over to her. And then she was freaking out like, what? I had no idea. And there was a big, she thought she caught him having an affair, but he actually turned the tables on her. Does, uh -huh. does that one ring a bell at all? It, it does. It sounds very familiar. And if it was real, I'd be surprised, honestly, because it sounds too perfect, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I would say there's a 90% chance we set that one up. Although, honestly, I don't remember. Yeah. And I, 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 we definitely, there were real ones. Um, whether there were more real than fake, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. Okay. I don't remember. Interesting. But yeah. Yeah, nice. it's all good theater one way or the other. Yeah, absolutely. Right? <laughs> it was intriguing as a listener. It was it kept us hooked and was fun to to tune in each week and see what was going on and it yeah. was always appreciated. Um you guys always had really I think that was part of the appeal too, was the the stories were and the um approach you guys had was just very real and it didn't come across as uh you mentioned having fans earlier and how that's weird. And it's because mm -hmm. uh radio DJs don't often carry the persona of like a rock star there carry the persona of i'm just a guy playing music and talking on the radio like anyone else you might talk to at a bar or at a coffee shop or whatever right and um so you don't have that uh i forget what i was gonna say um you don't often have that, that same mystique, mystique right? that you have yeah. with you know fans and things and so it's a very different uh world to come in is i think to hear all the theater work that went into doing the show behind the scenes like that and yeah and that approach on things it's uh it made it very listenable and very um, very approachable and very easy for a lot of people to connect, not only to the voices that were, you know, introducing the songs, but also mm. these people that were doing uh, the different bits you guys had, where you're, whether it's interviewing a comedian or things like Wiener Wednesday, where you're basically reading real world stories that have happened to uh, various, you know, members of the audience. And uh, Dial a Date was like that too. It was, I was never a big fan of dating shows over the years, mm -hmm. uh, whether television or otherwise, but the way that show ran um, was just very easy for all of my friends to listen to. And it was mm. something about that appealed to a lot of the, a lot of people I knew and yeah, just had a really good, it was a very easy show to get drawn into and, and listen to. And yeah, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad we weren't just, you know, shooting our mouths off the dead air. Not at all. Actually, uh, <laughs> you mentioned earlier how it's weird, how um, this one random moment of you guys throwing br day old bread over the balcony is what led you into doing radio. And it is kind right. of funny how, one random little event can have a domino effect into other things that happen later on in life. I actually started working in the video game industry years ago mm. uh, because I played guitar in a top 40 cover band down in Vacaville. Uh, my keyboard player's brother had a job at a video game company and I, he said, oh, I'll, I'll hand a resume in for you. I was looking for work. And so I gave uh. him a resume and he said, oh, how do you know Chris? Oh, I play guitar in a band with his brother. Turned out the guy I was interviewing with was a big guitar player. So I got the job there and ended up working in the video game industry for a few years. Right. And that's actually how I initially met you guys. That's how was, we met, right. Um, one of the stories you guys were giving on the air was about, I think it was you, it might have been Sean, talking about, uh, you might not remember this, um, 
think one of you had a video game you bought on CD and it wasn't spinning in the CD drive. I was working in tech support at the time, so we got right. these weird calls all the time. And uh, you guys had a, one of you had a video game that there was paint or the ink on top of the disc was too thick and the CD wouldn't spin in the drive. Mm. So you took the disc out and sort of sanded Sand down all the paint it. off the top of it to make it thinner so it would fit in the drive and spin, not realizing that if you sand too deep, it'll cut through the actual information embedded in right. the CD. So it ends up uh, corrupting the CD and making it unusable. Yes. You guys happen to be telling this story, and then the follow-up bit where you called into uh, the video game company that you bought it from, and fed him some fake story about, oh, my kid got a hold of the disc and he was playing record company guy and he tried to paint his own label on the top of the disc and mess it up. So now it doesn't work. Can you guys send me another one? These darn kids, I'll, I'll <laughs> yell at him for that for you. And, and you're telling the story and how about how the video game tech on the phone bought it hook, line, and sinker and sent you uh -huh. a new one. I happened to be driving to my job as a video game tech support guy <laughs> while that story was being read on the air. And I was dying laughing. I had to pull over to the side of the road. I was cracking up so hard it took me like 10 minutes to compose myself I'm like I cannot believe this is happening to these guys I was dying laughing listening to this so I got to the office and then thought I've got to send these guys a box of some t-shirts or something that was hilarious <laughs> so I went to the supply room and grabbed I don't remember what I sent you guys a couple of t-shirts and a game or something I think and uh, wait, shot I'm sure and, I still have the game yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> I um so I remember shooting that off and I think it got lost in your mail room for a month or so and I didn't hear anything and I oh. I kind of forgotten about it went back to doing my work and one day I got a phone call and I think you would call in and said hey I just found the box you guys sent thanks very much that was awesome and and uh here we are years later and we've yeah, right. kept in touch off and on over the years and I think I um Give you guys a tour of Skywalker Ranch once when I was out yes. there. And yeah, boy, that was that unforgettable. And, that was amazing. Um, yeah, it was fun. They had, I remember, uh, that was right before episode one came out. Mm -hmm. We were all on very, very strict rules about do not disclose anything episode one related to anybody. Yes. Everything was kept behind locked, like not only locked doors, but like signed locked doors. There was like a sign in sheet on the outside of if you were allowed in the part of the buildings where the episode one stuff was, mm -hmm. that wasn't enough. You had to go into that into the building and there was a, a guard like watching all those different things. Uh. So you'd go in and you'd find the the woman in charge of the secretary or whatever in charge of that building and you'd have to sign in and say, okay, I'm going into storage room number three. Uh. I'm going to look at this reel of footage and then I'm going to put it back. And that's so you had they had a log of like who knew which plot lines and who had seen which pictures of which droids and everything. Wow. They kept it really, really under lock and key. Uh -huh. So I thought, okay, I can, I can take you know these guys out to Skywalker Ranch, no problem. Anything mm -hmm. that's important will be locked up and off to the side. We're good. And you and I and Sean went walking through one of the dining room areas. Nothing, nothing important. They actually had, it was supposed to be that everything important was on the second floor of the building. Okay. Right. And nobody was allowed on the second floor. So my Got thought it. was, as long as we don't go upstairs... We're set. No problem. Right. So we go in and do the typical tourist lap around. Here's Indiana's whip. Here's the C-3PO <laughs> thing, blah, blah, blah. And we came around and through one of the front dining rooms. And I remember looking over and seeing a poster off to the side, which was clearly a Natalie Portman yes. dressed yes. up thing. I'm like, it was oh, the Amidala head wrap. <laughs> That's really not supposed to be here. I have to put on the most unbelievable <laughs> po poker face right now. So that these guys don't start snapping pictures and then we all lose our jobs and get sued. And, <laughs> oh, I don't know what that is. You know, just let's just keep walking. And I hear one of you guys pick a comment like, oh, we saw something. <laughs> Somebody left that out. They were not supposed to leave that out. I had no idea. I was doing the regular route I do when I take people here. And Yeah, it was like it was like a concept art that was just like leaning yeah, against something the Something they just yeah, left there for whatever reason, either. Yeah. I don't know who, you know, George or somebody. They used to yell at people a lot about that kind of thing. You could lose your job over wow. leaving the wrong concept art in the wrong spot or taking something with you. They took secrets like that really, really seriously there. Uh -huh. So it was, of all the times <laughs> that they leave concept art out, it's when I go traipsing through the ranch with a couple yeah. of radio DJs. Right. Oh, da -da -da -da, nothing to see here. I'm not exactly known for their discretion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. In that case, we kept our mouths shut. So we didn't even know what we were looking at. I mean, it was just. And I really like, didn't know at the time either because it wasn't yeah. in one of the rooms that I was allowed access to. It was just out in the, out in the space. It wasn't, I didn't actually look at that much episode one stuff in advance. I, mm. a little, I guess a little bit I did. I worked on, I worked on two of the games for that. But anyway. Yeah, well, I, my head was spinning so much from everything else that was involved on the tour that, you know, one little picture leaning against the, the wall was not not likely to yeah. <laughs> catch my eye from the bigger stuff. There's a lot I of mean, gnarly stuff out there to look at, even wow. on a regular day. It's just amazing. I mean, just walking into the into the, into the the um, soundstage where the orchestra records yeah. the music and... 
I, could oh, I know just, they have I the most ridiculous. I could have set up camp in there. That was crazy. They have the most ridiculous recording studio of any place I've ever seen out, uh, yeah. out at Skywalker Ranch. It's it's really sick. Yeah, that was that. Thank you for that. That was once in a lifetime. <laughs> my, <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good time. So, um, you guys went to uh, the zone, mm-hmm. um, and then from the listener perspective, the show was more or less the same kind of show. The station has a little bit of a different sonic format, but mm-hmm. it was the morning show. Did you guys make any conscious decisions to approach the show differently there? Or was it just more of, let's just do what we're doing? And, and Yeah, it was, let's do what we're doing. Um, it was not nearly as free form at the zone as it was yeah. over at Quad because we actually had people monitoring us. So, you know, they'd tell us when we were going on too long or when we needed to, you know, just how to structure the show and, you know, keep, stick to the, the format clock and make sure we play all the songs we need to play in an hour. Yeah, there are, there are times at Quad when we play like three, four songs in an hour, which would have just, that would not fly at the zone. That's, you, you don't do the, here's the clock, here's where the songs play. You've got to play all these 10 songs because you've got to get all the commercials in and all this stuff. And so, yeah, we, we had to tighten up our, our ship a little bit. But um, yeah, in, in terms of the, the content, it was pretty much the same. Okay. Just very sort of loosely structured. Let's talk about what's happening in our day and our lives and probably could have benefited from a little bit more uh, pre-show planning because we had a tendency to go off the cuff a little too much. And sometimes you don't really have anything to say, but if that's the case, you just play a song. So, and then Sean was more of a director of programming or something at the zone, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, Toward the, toward the end of our run together, he had become the um, assistant program director. So he was sort of wearing a bunch of different hats at the time. Okay. And you were, you were focusing on just doing the DJ thing and Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, it was partly because Sean was really interested in doing that. Um, and partly because the, the people who were running the station at the time liked him better than me. So <laughs> I didn't okay. have quite the opportunities that he did. So that uh, ended at some point and Sean stayed as program director, but they didn't do the morning show thing anymore. Right? They yeah, he stayed. That. He stayed on. They moved him to afternoons and they showed me the door. Because they really again liked him better than they liked me. So that's, that's and again, I'd love to have a great story of intrigue about why the show broke up and, you know, some huge drama filled. No, it was just, you know, they had decided that it was time to change things up. You know, it seemed like it was getting a little bit stale from a management perspective. And um, they liked Sean and they didn't like me. So they kept Sean and they threw me out. Okay. And, um, so they moved Sean to afternoons and he was also assistant programming. And then a short time later, they moved him back with a different partner back into mornings. Okay which he did for uh, a year or two more after that. And then he left to, to go do his own thing. Right, okay. And that's what he's doing now, right? Is his own retail radio business? Retail radio, exactly. What, is the, yeah. what do they do exactly? They are, it's, wow, they've got lightning in a bottle. It's, um, it's Sean and a couple of the ex, uh, ex-sales people from CBS and a guy who handles the tech side of it that Sean had known previously. Um, the four of them broke off and formed this little company And the concept of it was the way Sean sort of initially pitched it to me because he's a huge TiVo fan, um, was a TiVo for music. And the way it worked was initially they had, they, they, they designed this little box that you as a client, if you wanted to use their service would take this box and plug it into your phone jack at night. And it would download from retail radio central, your entire music playlist for the next day. So you take your little box and you plug it into your sound system in your store and you have a pre-programmed 24 hours of music that is like all the format you want, whatever it is you decide you want to hear. Okay. And then in between the songs, you get retail radio will custom produce in house commercials for you. So whatever you want to promote in your store, you have these little custom made promos that, that run in between the songs. So it's just like a traditional radio station where you have the songs broken up by advertising, but now all the ads are for you as the client, right? So yeah, they, they started out, very small with just a handful of, of people signing on. And I guess their big break was when um, uh, Sleep Train uh, locally said, let's try it out in all of our stores. Oh, nice. And that was their first really big client. And they had a lot of success and it took off. And today they've got, wow, uh, I forget how many, tens of thousands of stores that they're in across the country and internationally. Nice. They've got people all over the place. Wow. It's doing really well. Yeah. yeah it's doing fantastic. And they've, so, as they've gotten better, they've sort of progressively fine tuned the different musical formats that they have. And they've sort of expanded their production capacity so they can 
produce more of the little custom commercials in between everybody's songs and it's it's taken off like wildfire nice yeah, yeah. okay does he do radio DJ type stuff anymore as well? or As far work? as I know, not at all, unless somebody asked him to do something on the side. He's so busy with what he's doing right now. Right. Um, yeah, and I never really, I, we talk all the time. I still, I still work for him. I'm, I'm one of their, I'm one of their part-timers. Okay. So um, I do voice work for them and a bunch of other miscellaneous stuff on the side. So we talk all the time and um, he's never really talked to me about, you know, missing it enough to actually go back and do it. But I think he misses the creative outlet of it because he's he's on the ground floor of that company he's one of the four principal owners so he's got he wears a million hats and he's always busy doing a million different things that are as far removed from the happy-go-lucky slap happy world of radio dj that we used to do as you could possibly be i mean it's very corporate button down stuff that he winds up doing a lot of the time and so i'm sure there's a part of him that misses you know the ease and freedom of the old days when you could just kick up your feet for four hours and talk about whatever, but he's, he's onto such a good thing over there and nice. Uh, I'm sure he's, he's very happy. Okay. And you're mostly focusing on voiceover work yep. these days, right? Yep. Like yep. commercials or what kind of things? Whatever, do you do? whatever you got. Yeah. What kind of I've stuff done. have you done? Um, it's probably mostly commercial work. Um, but the part that I really like that I'm really gravitating toward is anything that lets me do more character based work. Yeah. Um, so I love doing audio books uh, I love doing video games. I love doing animations, cartoons, that kind of stuff. And those opportunities are fewer and further between than the commercial stuff. Sure. But um, every time I get them, I latch onto it. It's just, it's so much fun. What, uh, what kind of cartoons or video games have you done? Uh, the, uh, the video game stuff, cartoon stuff, it's all been just little, small little projects that people are, you know, you know, they have these dreams. I want to start my own YouTube channel and start my own little animation series and they'll put out this casting call for we need voices to do this and that and um every team that i've been on we've you know we've put the voice work together they've written a couple of scripts and then they try to produce it with the animation and generally things tend to fall apart at that point because they can't get people it takes forever to do the animation and usually when they're starting they're not paying anyone so you know we, i have all these little projects that you know started and never really have seen seen their way through to fruition sure. Um, I think the only, the only animation one that has actually made it into finished product is one that, um, a company in West Sacramento was doing, um, called pride animation. And they did, um, uh, a little series called OMG ghosts, which is about a series. It, it's about two, it, it's sort of a takeoff on the whole ghost hunters, but in this case, the main characters are the ghosts and the two ghosts try to prank the ghost hunters who are you know, trying to okay. either prove or disprove their existence. And it was a fun concept and they had a lot of fun characters and I got to do a couple episodes of that and they shut down after like six episodes. It really kind of went nowhere. Um, but that's, I mean, just doing the, the characters, you can be so over the top and so fun with it. Um, as far as video games go, uh, the biggest ones that I've done has been from a company called um, Phoenix Online and they did a series that actually went over really well and sold fairly well. It's it's about uh, a woman who has these sort of pre and post cognitive powers. She's a, a detective, but she can she starts to realize that she can sort of see things that happened in the past, and she can see things that are going to happen in the future. And you, as the player, sort of use these powers to solve these different crimes. And it was sort of very much in the vein of what you used to do over at, at Lucas Arts, the whole graphic adventure sure. type um, games. And uh, I got to play a recurring character in that series where um he's it's like her the the main character's um unrequited love interest partner um and that was really fun to do and then i got my own i got a starring role in one game that just tanked it was it turned <laughs> out to just be awful but the script for it came in like this i don't know like inch inch and a half thick binder i mean it's the biggest thing acting wise that i've ever done it took like three eight hour sessions to record all the lines in this thing and he's this uh this sort of hard-boiled film noir detective back in the 1940s so it was a very fun uh role to play and yeah that was my first big boy uh video game project nice. and i wish it had done better than it did but it, it this they, they had a whole sequel planned and it, it yeah the, the first one didn't warrant yeah. <laughs> getting back into the studio so video games are a lot like um musicians making cds in that respect not all mm. of them do well not, not all of them turn a profit it's right a, you know some of them do exceptionally well and then others you hope they break even and then most of them kind of 
lose their funding and peter out and whatever and just it's not a matter always it's not always a matter of the game not being fun sometimes right. if the market is flooded or all the typical stuff that happens to movies and, and music and everything else happens to video games it's just a slightly different demographic right, right. so when you do your voiceover uh, work for those do you have a home studio that you record everything at mm-hmm. yep, what kind of do. setup do you use to to do the work uh let's see right now um i've got a um uh, my my software I use is uh, Adobe Audition, okay. and I feed uh, into that with a Audient ID22, which is sort of a combination interface preamp. Okay, and the microphone is a damn it, what the hell's my microphone? <laughs> I did the chain backwards because I'm like I'm blocking on the name of the microphone, and I'm trying to. Remember. You don't use an SM7 anymore? <laughs> I no, I used to use that, but I upgraded to a uh, tube condenser microphone. Oh, nice! Which I had always read was warm and velvety and smooth and it does these fun things with the tone of your voice and i'm like ooh, i'd like to sound more velvety and smooth so i got this microphone it's killing me that i can't it'll come to me in a second but um yeah it did it works as as promised um and i yeah i love the thing yeah it's it's i mean it's out of a closet it's nothing fancy and i, I treated the walls with a little bit of acoustic you know foam and it's but it's it's certainly low budget from that respect but you get a good sound out of it you know with the with the chain that i've got it works really well nice. so when a video game company or a commercial or whatever yeah you're holding your hands up in victory what mojave mojave oh mojave audio yes they make yes. great stuff a mojave 310 okay that's my microphone so, yeah they make all kinds of good stuff yeah i'm a big fan it works really well okay nice. so i'm sorry continue <laughs> <laughs> um so when you uh when you're doing a voiceover project for a, a game or a commercial or whatever the thing is how does that work? They just they send you a script and kind of let you go nuts, and then you record three or four different variations of the line of them pick. Yeah, or? it's happened. It's happened both ways. It's happened. Usually, they'll you know you'll send out an audition for the character, and they'll say, "Okay, we like your voice. Here's a few lines. Give it a try." Like you say, a few different ways. And um, yeah, they can. I mean, it's nice that you you don't all have to be in the same place now. I mean, you can just email your lines from whatever studio you happen to be in, which works out well. Yeah, like I said, most of them, you, I've sent my lines out there and then it's, you know, it's been a year later and they haven't ever produced anything with it. So I have no idea what the finished product sounds like. I mean, there's some, I've got a, a, like somebody's doing a Superman fan film animation that he's been working on for like a year and a half that I'm like, I've got a pretty juicy part as a, as a, a military general in there that I'm just dying to hear how it came out. Nice. I have no idea if I'll ever get a chance. There's another guy that <laughs> I probably should even mention what the project is because i had to sign a non-disclosure agreement in order to do the part but the premise is really funny and it i I, i'll 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 say this much it has to do with the founding fathers in a very non-traditional setting oh you're doing the the founding fathers that's what you're telling me i'm kidding (laughs) and i did some fantastically fun i'm not not like from the quality of the work I did, but just the opportunity to just go like turn the dial to 11 with these characters. I mean, just as over the top as you can imagine, it was so much fun to do. And I did like two or three different characters for this thing. I have no idea if it's ever going to see the light of day or not, but God, I hope so. Cause I can't wait to see what they did with it. Nice. But yeah, you just, you send your lines out there and you hope something gets done with it. Okay. And then there are other times with like the games where it's, um, you know, they pretty much know from the get go that this thing is going to get produced. And so I go to their studio. Okay. And, they sort of set up the whole process and I just record there and they put the whole thing together themselves. Nice. So yeah, from, from my perspective, it's easier to do that because it's, you know, I like being in a situation where I just have to just talk and not have to worry about tweaking all the stuff afterwards, but that's fun to do too, because it gives me a whole different skill set that I otherwise wouldn't have. Yeah. My issue with recording at home is psyching myself up enough to do it when Mm -hmm. there are other people in the building understood trying to get into character or into songwriter mode or whatever the case may be right Right. if i know that there's someone you know outside the other door doing dishes or whatever the thing is that's happening out there and Mm -hmm. is that the do you record when they're like you have a wife and kids one kid or one one kid kid? yeah Yeah. so do you record when they're home or do you wait until they're gone and does that Uh, affect you at all it doesn't really affect me as long as they keep quiet it's usually fine um i've had my son in the room with me when i'm doing stuff and actually (laughs) He came this close to out earning me last year. Really? Yeah. Because I, he, you know, it's kind of puff up when I, when I think about it, you know, he's watching dad do it and he's like, Oh, that's cool. I want to do what dad does, which is uh, as a dad is a very cool moment. Um, So I always have an eye out for people who are looking for young kids 
um, to audition. And every time I see something, I have him send an audition. And he he's actually landed a couple of jobs already that paid really well. Nice. I'm like, you little punk. You, <laughs> you just had earned me this month. You know that? How old is your son? He's 12. 12, okay. Yeah, so he's almost 13 now. Old enough to where he actually can do the math then and figure out, oh, check it out, Dad. Here's what yeah, I right. paid. What did you make on that project? Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah, right. Just you wait till next month, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's fun. And yeah, it's, um, yeah, I don't really... Um, I'm trying to do more stage acting, so I'm kind of getting over the, it, it was weird making the transition from being on the air where nobody sees you talk to being on stage where everybody sees you talk. Yeah. And it, there was a little bit of a hump to get over in terms of being comfortable doing it. Sure. But I, I think all those years of radio kind of numbed me to the whole stage fright thing. I really just don't have it a lot. So that's a good thing, I think, for what I'm doing. Yes. It means I can be relaxed in a lot of different environments. What kind of uh, stage work are you doing? Uh, a lot of just community theater stuff. Okay. Um, there's a group in Sacramento that I've done like four or five different plays with, and um, I'm rehearsing one now in Roseville. So yeah, I'm just kind of bouncing around whenever. I'm trying to limit it to like two a year because I what I did, what I didn't realize before I started acting was when you're doing a play, and particularly in the week or two right before the thing opens up, you're there like every day. Yeah, Tech Week is brutal. Yeah, exactly. And uh, <laughs> I didn't realize how much time that would take me away from my family, nor did my family realize how much time that would take me away from my family. So I definitely have to pick and choose, you know, and not do too much of that stuff. I, I do audio for theater production stuff here and there, whether uh -huh. either audio engineering, running the soundboard and such, or um, playing in the pit band, doing guitar band leader type stuff. And Very cool. Same, huh? same kind of premise of like, mm -hmm. the show itself is only three days, but there's that week before the show where you're, you're at the theater, you know, 15 hours a day, pretty much nonstop, making sure right. all the I's are dotted and everything is going on, you know, correctly so that the show can open without a massive failure in front of everything. And, right, exactly. But yeah, it's definitely, it's fun. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of work that, it, much like radio programming, I'm sure there's, you know, when you're on the air for two hours, that doesn't mean the DJs are only in the building for two hours. There's prep work before, and then there's wrap up afterwards you have to do to... Maybe apologize for all the legal right. fine lines that you cross crossed to be crossed and, made. Yes, right. And, uh, whatever the things are. But. Right. Well, and, and to complicate matters further, um, because my wife is the one who's going out of the house now and working, I'm doing all my stuff freelance out of out of the home studio. So I'm I'm the work at home dad now. So that means all the domestic stuff is on my plate now. You know, I'm cooking the meals and I'm washing the dishes and doing the laundry and all that stuff. So when I'm, you know, spending six hours a day at the theater, that's, yeah, things tend to, the, the, the train goes off the tracks really quick. Right, the so dishes I, pile up quicker. And, mm -hmm, yeah, which makes me feel kind of, you know, it makes me feel useful, but in a whole different way now, <laughs> with a whole different appreciation for that skill set. Nice. It's like, wow, that takes, uh, yeah, that takes a lot of time. So your main focus is still audio related stuff. You just kind of made the switch from radio into voiceover and then mm -hmm. yeah. How long Which, ago did you start doing the acting? Uh, it's been maybe three years now that I kind of really flipped the switch and made the transition. And I, again, not realizing at the time I figured coming from a radio background would be a real benefit. And in a lot of ways it is, but in a lot of ways it's a detriment too, because people in radio have a tendency to develop that broadcaster voice, you know, and everything turns into the DJ voice and talking like this. And, you know, when you're trying to act, well, it's got to sound authentic, right? And, and you, you, you think going into it, oh, I got this because I, you know, I've spent my career behind a microphone, you know, and I know the microphone technique and I've got the voice built up for it and all that stuff. And those things can be assets, but they can also drag you into the wrong direction if you're not careful. So it's like you have to learn this whole new acting based skill set, which has been really fun. And, and you know, the sketchiness of the of being able to earn a living with it aside, I just love the fact that as a guy rapidly approaching 50, I can still reinvent myself and do something else. And there's still an opportunity to learn new skills and a new and, and take the plunge and try a new career. And, you know, I, when I was younger, I just had this mindset that, you know, you, you think yourself locked into where you are for life and to realize that it's not that way at all. And that at any point you can jump tracks and try something new granted with a lot of support from other people, which others aren't as fortunate to have as I am just to know that you have the ability to do that releases you of so much fear. Or at least it did for me. You know, you, you, you think, you know, what am I going to do if I don't have a regular paycheck coming in? And you know, that's a legitimate concern, but you know, there's a point where I, I got fired so much 
that I had to not be so afraid of that anymore because if I was, I'd spend my day under my desk shaking. You know, I got to the point where it's like, okay, I got fired from another job. Something else will happen. And I found it like once you release yourself from that burden of fear, not to get too philosophical or anything, but I mean, it, you start, you start to focus more on the opportunities than on the fears. And that's, it's just really liberating, especially at my age to feel like that's still possible. I know? completely agree. I've had similar, um, mindsets or, uh, light bulb moments, if you will, mm -hmm. recently too, realizing like, you know, it, it is possible to do what you love and make a living. You might have to, you know, put in longer hours, certain days or do certain things, but mm -hmm. not all of us are just meant to have the typical office job of the dockers and the collared shirts and right. the business casual Thursdays, you know, stuff that some companies think is great. And yeah. it just wasn't working for me. And I've, I've done the same, had the same kind of approach lately. And it's, it, yeah, it takes a lot of work and support from your family and other people to mm -hmm. do it. But if you have the ability to do what you love and make a living at it, even if it is uh, a little bit more random with when the paychecks show up or a little yep. bit harder to predict the Monday through Friday kind of schedule to work family and other events around, it mm -hmm. definitely makes the overall level of happiness better for not only the person doing that, but then everyone else around them. Everyone around them, exactly. it has a ripple effect and makes it better for everyone overall that way. And yeah, yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. I'm, yeah, I'm doing everything I can to fight having an office job as much as possible too, <laughs> whether it be through music stuff or through building websites and mobile apps for people as a freelance business or, you know, something between those two worlds. I'm mm -hmm. doing the same thing I can to kind of fight ever having to go back into a key card access door driven building ever. Uh, right. It's kind of funny that you're, uh, now that I just use that phrase, kind of funny that your foray into doing audio and entertainment related things for a living started from a key card, a key card door yes. that wasn't actually locked though. It's like, well, there's a security card thing here that looks like it's a big stuffy security building, but they're not actually paying attention to that. We can just walk right in and do what we want to do and go upstairs to where the little dark dimly lit DJ booth is and, throw day old bread over the balcony and get it to the DJs and <laughs> yes. start your life mm. on an entirely different path. Yeah. No metaphor there, huh? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Just, it, it is. It's very interesting how the smallest little events can cause a great big domino effect of other things to happen, you know, like this. Yep. And, yep. I, and I don't know whether it, it, it makes me think that, that things are preordained or not, but it, I'm definitely, if not that, I definitely have become a believer the older I get that, uh, in a lot of situations, coincidence is not coincidence, you know, and maybe it just has to do with attitude and putting yourself out there where the opportunities are so that you're there when they, when they happen. I think a lot of it has to do with that, putting your energy into the certain things that you're supposed to put your energy into. And sometimes right. it's really scary to try to do that and make that uh -huh. first leap for whatever the action is or whatever the case may be that's preventing you from doing that. But yep. uh, I've been trying to do a lot more not to get all philosophical myself, but I like I've, where this is yeah, heading. I've, I've been <laughs> trying to do a lot more of stepping outside of the comfort zone lately and realizing, you know what? Yeah. I think that thing over there would make me much happier than I am right now. Mm -hmm. And yes, it'll be a really, really scary leap to jump over whatever's in front of me to get there. But you only live once. Let's try that and see what happens over there. And because of that, I've been doing much more music lately and being much more creative and generally overall happier and Again, I'm going to fight having a day job as much as I possibly can. It sounds like you've been doing the same thing for exactly a while right. and it's working out okay. <laughs> partly, uh, partly by design and, <laughs> and part of the time it was quite against my will, but <laughs> either way. Yeah. yeah, when I think about the highlight moments of whatever it is I've been doing professionally, they've all been when I was in that outlier status, you know, either when I was doing my own thing as a, as a freelancer or independent contractor or when I was just shooting the breeze at a radio station, you know, all the, all the non-conventional stuff. Those are the things that tend to stand out as the spikes on my graph of fun stuff, you know? Yeah, absolutely. My, my favorite moments of my career have all been doing independent freelance things too, or, or at least working in big creative environments, like doing the video game thing. Those were technically larger corporate, you know, publicly traded companies, but they were still video game companies. So as long as the shareholders got whatever they needed taken care of financially, they kind of let us all run amok in the building, much like the independent radio stations did. They didn't care right. what you wore. They didn't really care what hours you kept. Just show up, you know, write code, draw the graphics. As long as we get our game done by Christmas time, right. you know, we'll kind of leave you alone and keep throwing free pizza and beer at you until <laughs> everything is accomplished. And nice perks. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's literally how some of the companies work. There was one I worked for briefly that every Friday at like three o'clock, they would just shut down and fill the kitchen with snacks and sodas and turn the TV on and say, all right, you know, you guys have worked long enough. Just go in there and, you know, decompress for a few hours and hang out. And anyway, um, fantastic. 
But uh, thank you so much for coming and yeah, it's my pleasure. It was awesome hearing how you started doing this and on all the different adventures that have happened along the way. I had no idea that was that the conversation would go this way, you know, as it did. But it was fun hearing how everything kind of flowed together and and what you're up to and what Sean is up to and Mm -hmm. doing all the acting work that you're doing now and all of that sort of thing and. Yeah, well, yeah, you uh, you may have to bring uh, bring one or both of us back for a follow up because it's you know it, we're both kind of at sort of pivot points. I would love lives, to have both you know? of you guys come back and talk about what you've been up to since then and learn more about re- retail radio and that sort of thing. And yeah, I'm sure Sean yeah. can go on and on about it. He's I, I I have so much respect for the salespeople on that side of the building and doing what they do, but Sean is the guy who really knows that company like inside and out because he's had to wear so many different hats doing what he's doing. Yeah, I'm sure he'd love to, to mix it up and talk about what's what's going I on. Would, I would absolutely love to have you guys back here, yeah. I'm not sure if he remembers who I am, but please tell him I said hi when you see oh, him. Oh, yeah, again. I'm sure he does. Because unlike me, Sean doesn't forget people. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I have this horrible thing where I like have to introduce myself to people five times before I realize that I've met them before, like four times before. It, yeah, Sean doesn't forget faces or things like that. So he's, yeah, I, I trust his memory way more than I trust okay. mine. Cool, well, yeah, please tell him I said hi when you... Uh... When you see him again. Yeah, You guys definitely. had a producer that worked with you around then too. I, I want to say her name was Kim. Kim, yes. What's she Kim. doing these days? She is on the air in San Francisco now. Really? She is. Is it KFI? Uh, I'm trying to remember what station she works at. She's a big, she's with a big station in San Francisco. Okay. And she's, she's doing, um, uh, it's uh, like reporting, uh, like a metro traffic-y kind of a thing. Okay. Slash news reporting. Um, and she's married now. She's got, uh, she's got a little girl. Yeah, she's doing fantastic, and we yeah we have all a long list of of producers that all you know whether they're still in the industry or not. Everybody's everybody's chugging right along, they're doing their thing. Thank you so much for for coming and doing this again. This was my pleasure. Um, this was a lot of fun, and really enjoyed you know catching up with you and talking on the show. Um, I'm sure everyone else will too when they listen and see what you've been up to and hear. You know, it was fun kind of reminiscing about some of the old quad stories. And yeah, yeah. Us old timers do tend to ramble on a bit. So. No, 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 not at all. It was thanks for your indulgence. It was fascinating <laughs> hearing the uh, hearing the different behind the scenes things. I had I I got bought hook line and sinker. I had no idea that the make the calls were faked. I, I probably should have put two and two together about some of those. But yeah, well, I I don't, I don't even know if I should have said anything about it. But we'll know if you ever talk to Sean because he'll smack me in the head and say, "What the hell did you say?" <laughs> that? We'll bring so. video cameras in for that part of the show and and get some YouTube footage for. For that, Perfect. if it happens, and uh, <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming down and hanging out. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. This is a, yeah, this is a blast. It's great. You know, it, it's nice knowing I haven't forgotten at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was absolutely a lot of fun. I appreciate you go you coming down and yeah. Please tell Sean and uh, Kim I said hi if um whenever you talk to those guys again next and uh, I would love to have any combination of the three of you back in here and we'll do another program to talk about what Sean's up to now and very cool. I will speak for them and say anytime. Awesome. That'd be great. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you.